So uh, Peter Wallace has kindly come to us um, for the second year from Atlanta, Georgia. And Peter is the head of dayone.org, uh, a wonderful radio ministry. And before he interviews our panelists, I'd like you, Peter, to come and say a word about Day One for those who may not know about it, because it's a wonderful ministry that you have. And uh, thank you for being here. Oh, God bless my you. My pleasure. Thank you, Peter. I had so much fun last year, and I'm just shocked that Peter invited me back. Um, but I am very grateful. I bring you greetings from Atlanta, Georgia. If I were a betting man, which I am not, especially in a Baptist church, I would suggest that I'm probably the southernmost personage here. I thought you were going to talk about the upcoming Toronto football club game against the uh, That's right, Atlanta, Atlanta United. <laughs> At any rate, uh, thank you. Uh, day one celebrates 75th anniversary next year. We started in 1945. I was not there, but it started in 1945 as the Protestant Hour and has been on hundreds of stations over the years. We're on about 200 stations across the U.S. We are on one station in Canada, um, in Nova Scotia, I believe. Uh, but you can get us online at dayone.org or through a podcast app. Each week we have a wonderful preacher who will uh, share a lectionary-based sermon. Scott Jose has been on there. Susan Sparks has been on there. And uh, it's just a wonderful celebration of preaching and the Word of God. So check it out. Thank it's inspiring. You. Now Peter suggested he's from the further south. Is there anyone from further south than Atlanta? How many are here from the GTA, the Greater Toronto Area? Okay. How many are from Southern Ontario outside the GTA? How many are from Northern Ontario? Anyone here from the North? Very good. Anyone here from the Maritimes? Wonderful. Eastern Ontario? Wonderful. And, and Western Canada? Anyone from anywhere else in the United States? Great. Wonderful to have all of you here. And. Um, Anywhere else in the world? It's wonderful to have you. Quebec. How many are here from Quebec? We have, are you from Quebec? Wonderful. So, um, without any further ado, Peter, thank you. Thank you, Peter. And what we want to do tonight is really just get to know these keynote speakers uh, for the Lester Randall Preaching Fellowship. Sorry that Otis Moss III could not be with us tonight, but I get to grill him separately before his service. So, um, but we just want to spend a little bit of time uh, getting to know these wonderful folks. So first of all, we're going to just go very briefly and, and say your name and briefly what you do. I'm Joni Sankin, and I teach preaching at United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. I'm Scott Jose. Uh, I direct uh, a, a center, a continuing education center at Calvin Theological Seminary in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and then I teach preaching along with John Rott, my, my colleague, who's also going to be here this week. Uh, my name is Meg Janista Kirkendall, and I am the pastor of the Washington, D.C. Christian Reformed Church, and I've been there for seven years. And uh, they let me teach some distance learning preaching classes through Calvin Seminary, so that keeps me in academia. So we want to go back and find out a little bit about your calling, how you ended up where you are here. If you would tell us some of the people and events that helped launch you on the path to how you are serving God now. And it could be as when you were young or later or whatever. Well, I don't know whether we have to keep kind of going down we'll the line. We'll rotate, but go ahead. I will go ahead and start us off. My Sunday school teacher when I was a kid at church, Joe Massonary, was someone who I think recognized the call in me before I would have recognized it in myself. I think I did not recognize it in myself until I was in college, my junior year of college, which would be my third year of, of, of university, I guess, here in uh, Canada. 
Um, I had a powerful experience. I was pre-law thinking I would go uh, to law school and then I had a very kind of powerful prayer experience where I was like, oh no, I think that is not the way that God wants me to go. And then I was very encouraged by a couple of professors. Uh, Stuart Showalter is one who uh, very much heavily fanned the flame of the call that was there. Um, so yeah, I did an internship then between college and seminary and found my way to, uh, to a Mennonite seminary initially and then not feeling challenged enough there. Uh, ended up at Princeton Theological Seminary. Um, Sally Brown was someone there who really nurtured a sense of maybe perhaps going on and doing more study. So after I had served briefly as a pastor, um, I'd gotten connected with Paul Wilson up here in Toronto. And I talked to Paul on the phone when I was a prospective student, and he mentioned the Holy Spirit in the conversation. I was like, oh, the Holy Spirit in an academic context? So, so that I thought, oh, this is, I think this is the, the place for me. Uh, and so he has also been really um, nurturing to my, to my sense of calling now as one who teaches, uh, teaches preaching. Um, well, I, when I was in high school, one of my religion teachers who was also uh, a pastor, his name is Lou Vandermeer. Uh, I really liked him a lot and uh, respected him a lot. And I think during high school or after the end of high school, I joined his church, in fact. He preached, we have on camp, I was a student at Calvin College in my freshman year. Uh, he preached at a worship service one Sunday morning. I was headed on a different career path. But while he was preaching, I felt God say, be a pastor. So I resisted that for a long time, uh, and then eventually kind of couldn't resist it anymore. So I talked to Lou, who um, encouraged, he gave, he, he gave me really good advice he, because I was afraid to do this, and I wasn't sure it was right, and it, boy, my, I was going to be in school forever, it seemed like, right? I was 19 years old. Um, but he said, take a few tentative steps in that direction, just tentative, you're not committed to anything, and see if there's confirmation. Well, that seems safe. So I did, and the confirmations came kind of fast and furious in the next three to four weeks even, not to mention the next five months. So I never looked back. Uh, I thought I was gonna hate taking Greek, and then I loved taking Greek. Uh, and everything else. So I was a pastor for 15 years, served two different parishes, two different churches. I had also uh, felt uh, that perhaps I was supposed to go on to graduate school in theology. Every time I took a step in that direction, though, the door seemed to close. And yet I really felt like I would like to teach, I would like to be in a seminary setting, but God just never confirmed graduate level work uh, for me for whatever the reason. But then a position opened at Calvin Seminary, my alma mater. They were opening a new Center for Excellence in Preaching. It was going to be a continuing education resource for pastors. And so I applied to become a director of that, and I got that uh, 14 years ago. And that became uh, a way for me to be in the classroom after all. Kind of came in sideways. Um, I appreciate Peter in the bulletin tonight, Dr. Scott Jose, thank you. Um, I will show that to my people back home and maybe they'll buy it. But, but so that's sort of how I moved from the parish. But, uh, but I, I, one of the things I've enjoyed by the path that I've had is that I see myself and I think my students see myself, and this is I think increasingly important to students today that you be an authentic practitioner as well as a theoretician. So to know that I preach two sermons a Sunday for 15 years gives you a little bit of cred. Uh, with students today, you kind of bridge that, that border territory between academy and church, uh, and that's something I've, I've enjoyed. I, I received a similar promotion by showing up here today, and I'm thrilled by my doctorate. Um, thank you, Lester Randall Preaching Fellowship. <laughs> um, because this is on my mind, I recently uh, returned from a trip to the Philippines, which is where I grew up, but it's where my grandparents were missionaries, and my grandmother never figured out how to retire. So she is 96 and living in the Philippines. Um, when she was in her 80s, 70s and 80s, they started uh, ministry in the women's prison and created a whole church structure within uh, the women's prison there in the Philippines. So. When I think about mentors, um, I think about her, and when we lived there, she lived with us. Um, but a piece of that story as well is that uh, 
I was raised in a, a very conservative, a fundamentalist background. Um, and my grandmother, who started this church in a prison, uh, it was also part of that. Um, so the idea of preaching in a church um, was, was never part of what was uh, held out to me as an option. Um, and so it was really going to seminary and I thought I would do some parachurch campus ministry, something uh, gender appropriate um, when I showed up at seminary. Um, and it was my professors there and the church that sent me to seminary. Um, you know, this is, well, why don't, why don't you, why don't you become a pastor? I'm like, oh, women wouldn't, women shouldn't be pastors. And they're like, well, that is adorable. Why don't you, why don't you just go to seminary and see what happens? Um, and so it was, it was those confirmations all along the way, um, and particularly in preaching class. Um, where I, I remember distinctly the first student sermon I ever gave, and I remember praying as I walked into that classroom, God, help me to suck at this. Um, because if I am terrible at preaching, then I get to do something else. Um, and I don't think it was an exceptional sermon, but I'm, I'm here. So <laughs> clearly that ball just kept rolling, um, and eventually I got on board. But... Uh, the importance of the external call and God's people um, suggesting that this was something I could do when I could not imagine for myself that it was something that I could do um, was really important. Thank you. Uh, well, you all mentioned people in your lives who help direct you, but are there uh, mentors or um, preachers or theologians or authors or artists today that you are finding life-giving and generative? And if so, who? Um, so a big piece of my research, which is, I, I had a professor in seminary tell me that um, Sometimes we do our therapy by way of our academic research, and I think that there's truth in that. Um, also, you should see a therapist. Um, but uh, in the past few years has been around the issue of race um, and politics, um, particularly because I'm in the United States and specifically in Washington, D.C. Um, and so, reading some homileticians that I didn't come across in my own uh, education up till that point has been really important. Um, Otis Moss III, who you'll all get to hear from, um, I'm really excited about that actually. Um, Dr. Kenyatta Gilbert, who teaches at um, Howard Div School um, in DC, has done some really great stuff recently. Um, and Frank Thomas, um, how to Preach a Dangerous Sermon. Um, those have been texts that have been really important to me. Um, I'd also add that they can assume certain things in their African-American context, whereas I feel like, oh, I have to do a remedial class in my context to get us to the place where we can have those common assumptions to do that homiletical work together. Um, there's some remedial work um, in my context and probably men, in many of our contexts. Um, but reading those homileticians helped me begin that process. I think for me personally, uh, a key mentor while I was in seminary and since, and now a friend and a colleague, you know, he was my professor of systematic theology, Neil Plantinga, Cornelius Plantinga Jr. Uh, Neil's been uh, an incredible influence on my life uh, ever since I first took a class with him in 1987. So, and Neil and I forged a really good partnership with seminars. So Neil has, uh, has done that. Uh, in terms of really helping me learn how to teach preaching and how to think about preaching, I've been very, very influenced over these last 14 years by my colleague, John Rotman, 
but both of us through Paul Scott Wilson. Paul uh, has really taught me a lot about preaching, how to think about preaching, how to name what I already knew, kind of, you know, when you've been preaching two sermons a week for 15 years, you can kind of do critical reflection on practice. What have I been doing uh, all these years? And Paul is somebody who has really helped name those things for me. And then in terms of other people um, whom I know or whom I've read, who have influenced me and have helped me think about preaching, be, be a better preacher myself, teach preaching better, uh, names uh, Meg already mentioned, uh, Frank Thomas, Luke Powery, uh, Barbara Brown Taylor, uh, also um, another person uh, who I've uh, had has influenced me a lot and I know a little bit, uh, Tom Long uh, has, has influenced me a lot. And certainly um, I, I, I referenced um, him uh, in my sermon this morning at Timothy Eaton, but Fred Craddock uh, and his works uh, also um, have, have been very formative and, and shaping for me as well. Um, I grew up in a very progressive Mennonite congregation, which for people who don't know, progressive Mennonites might sound a little strange if you're picturing the people with their bonnets. But um, it was a church that put a lot of focus on uh, service in the world. And there was really no talk about sin in my church growing up at all. And so uh, follow my call a few years down the way, when I found myself as a youth pastor in my early 20s, I was ready to just burn out because I could not save these kids that I was working with. I just couldn't, couldn't do it. Uh, in seminary then, I encountered John Calvin for the first time and was like, oh, I'm a sinner. Thank goodness. <laughs> it was such a relief. Uh, I had an experience of grace for the first time. And so Reformed theology has been kind of a, a companion for me, John Calvin and then Karl Barth, of course. Um, and then finding my way here to, to Toronto where I worked with Paul Scott Wilson and his focus on God being the primary actor in the sermon uh, was huge for me in terms of that relationship with human agency and God's agency. And that's been something that's really driven my work since then. So in addition to um, Paul Wilson, Tom Long has also been um, important for me. Just his storytelling is so fabulous in his preaching. It's really a, a great model. Fleming Rutledge, I love her preaching. She's just clear-eyed. She tells it like it is. Um, she has a huge book on the cross, uh, which is just a, a huge, rich resource. I've done also some work on that. Um, most recently, I've done quite a bit of work on trauma and preaching. I feel like preaching is always engaging with this kind of intersectional um, work where it's interdisciplinary and we're uh, interacting with culture. And unfortunately, I feel like trauma is just so present to us in our culture right now. So Shelley Rambo's work on uh, trauma, um, also, one of my colleagues at United uh, Theological Seminary, Andrew Park, his work on Han, which is a theology of, of the sinned against, that's also been really um, significant for me recently. So all of those folks. Um, Frank Thomas also is great. He, uh, up until very recently, has been teaching an intro to African-American uh, preaching class for us at United. And so I always enjoy having him cycle through periodically. Um, yeah. So this year's theme of the Lester Randall Preaching Fellowship is the faithful imagination. And at last year's conference, Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, said the world is filled with toxic fictions and fantasies, and preachers need to recapture the imagination. They need to lift people beyond mere words of warning to a vision of what the world can look like. You did that tonight in your sermon uh, to a, a wonderful degree, Scott. But how do you respond to that notion? What do you see as the role of the preacher in today's volatile culture? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll just start and let Meg and Joni think. Um, in other words, I'm going to speak without thinking first. Um, I do think something Joni, yeah, I think something Joni just said is important, and again, it's, it's Paul Wilson. Um, uh, God being the active presence in the sermon. And I think one of the, one of the biggest transformations that uh, I've seen in terms of my homiletical thinking over the last years is indeed that, I mean, Preaching, you can ask anybody, including people who go to church all the time, you know, ask people, you know, what do you, what do you think a sermon is, right? And, and often, you know, some people inside the church or outside will think, say, well, it's kind of a scolding thing, you know, uh, Madonna, 
had a very popular song 25 years ago, Papa Don't Preach, right? Uh, because preaching's bad. And if, it, you know, so it's scolding, it's finger wagging, um, or, you know, uh, I remember Fred Craddock said, you know, ask, ask the average person, what is a sermon? And they said, well, when in a sermon, uh, the preacher tells people what they need to hear. And Craddock said, well, sometimes there are things we all need to hear, truths we need to receive, but very often what a, what a good sermon will do is it articulates what people wish they could say. So the preacher articulates their thoughts and their fears and their struggles, and they say, ah, yeah, that's me. When I can't sleep at 3.03 and 4.17 and 5.12 and the, the clock radio keeps going, that's my question that keeps me awake. I'm listening now. What word of grace is there? So the idea that the sermon is, and I'm going to be talking about this Tuesday, so I don't want to talk about it now, um, lest I have nothing to say on Tuesday, but um, sermons should be good news. Uh, there's lots of things we need to do, and, and morality and discipleship comes in, but preaching should be, as John Lee was saying, as Paul has said, uh, an event where God is the chief actor, and we're going along for the ride. And, and therefore, right, it, 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 it fills our imaginations, and, and we, we should leave church not further burdened because the preacher ended the sermon with four things I have to do now this week again, though some people like that kind of preaching, but, but they leave with burdens lifted uh, and maybe have their imagination fired as we were talking about today. I can go ahead. Um, hmm. I'll be talking more about this on Tuesday as well, but I think um, we live in a world where people have a, increasingly um, lost touch with what the transcendent is. People don't have a frame of reference for that. Even people in our, in our congregations don't have a frame of reference for that. And I think um, one of the ways that evil functions in our world is to make us blind to where God is uh, so that we do lose hope and uh, become discouraged. And so I think part of our work as preachers is to show where God is active in our world. And I think it's the most important and the hardest part of every sermon is to say, what is God doing in our world today? Um, it's, it is a challenge. Every semester I warn my students, it does not get easier. This is, this is the hard work, but I promise if you enter into it, it not only will transform your preaching, but it also will transform your life and your spirituality because you'll start to become a person who sees God at work in our world and your congregation will start to become a group of people who sees God at work in, in the world. And so I think that is um, something very important that the church can, can offer um, that, that isn't in, in another place. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pick up on, I think you're both right, and I would want to echo what you're saying about what you're hoping to do at the tail end, by the tail end of the service as you're sending them. And I, I think something that's been real, real in my ministry, uh, let's say since 2016, if anything significant happened, in 2016 in the United States, um, has been recognizing the burdens that my congregation come in with um, and inviting them to bring that into the sanctuary instead of saying, we don't want to talk about that, we're going to come in here and have a good moment and send you back out into the world, but never having shown you through the worship service that what we're doing here is related to that and that the hope we have is not in ignorance to the discouragement that you might bring or um, the frustration or the anger or the sadness or whatever it is you're bringing with you for any reason into the church service, um, that is actually going to be met with the hope. Um, and so, and so being able to get real about where people are starting from, which is also a work of imagination, um, hopefully pastorally, pastoral care-informed imagination um, for who they are and what they're bringing with them um, so that you can do the tail end work of imagination as well. So I wanna dive a little deeper into that, Meg. Um, there is a rumor that um, Canada recently had an election. Um, is that true? 
Uh, and you Canadians may have heard that we are having an election next year. Um, yes. And, and so what is, what is the role of the preacher in that context of particularly a political season, political year? Uh, I had two or three day one preachers who were from the D.C. area who recorded uh, earlier this year, and each one of them said, you know, our membership is across the board politically, and so we intentionally hold a place where they can escape from all that. I had never thought about that because, you know, I, I'm thinking prophetic <laughs> preaching and all, all like this, but I can see the value of that. But what, what do you think uh, the role of the preacher is, particularly in a political season? Yeah, yeah, I'll own this, guys. I'll give you some time to think. Um, so I think we have to be really careful in minding our P's, um, leave the Q's aside for a minute, um, in terms of what we mean when we say political, um, prophetic, partisan, and policy. Um, and so I think so we've got four things, and um, I'm going to be talking more about this tomorrow morning, um, but I will steal my own thunder and say that the gospel of Jesus Christ is political. Um, it teaches us how to be in the world. That's politics, right? Who are we in the polis? Um, so that, that's a given. <laughs> Um, I, I don't know how you get around being political. And I think we are called to be prophetic. We are also called to be pastors. Um, and prophets don't usually stay in place very long. <laughs> um, so, it, right, yeah, they kill the prophets. Um, and maybe in our context, hopefully, they'll, you'll just move on to a different call. It won't have to come to quite that end. But... Um, so the prophetic is not, that's not what you do every week. Um, what you do every week is you pastor your congregation and nurture a theological imagination that is large enough so that when you have to speak a prophetic word, um, you're not going to get the response that a lot of preachers are getting, which is, you know, stay in your lane, pastor just preach the gospel, pastor, don't be political, pastor. Um, and, and I think that that's a problem that we've created by not creating a theological imagination large enough so that when we have to speak that specific prophetic word, it fits in a context. Um, but as weekly preachers, it's that context um, that we're going to be doing more often, um, nurturing more often than the prophetic. Um, the partisan, and I, I imagine that that's what my colleagues in D.C. are getting at, is um, that we're, we stand in a position where there's something to be said in, in favor of and against everyone um, and every political persuasion under the sun because the kingdom um, is not yet fully arrived. Um, so we stay out of partisanship. And then in D.C., I mean, it's a very real thing that people who are in my congregation are making policy during the week. Um, and, and I regularly tell them, that's above my pay grade. Um, I, as a preacher, I can't tell you to vote for H.R. 612 because I don't actually know, like, all of the riders that have been attached to this policy and what I'm actually telling people to call their senator to vote on. Like, I don't know how to do that. I will tell you that Jesus was a refugee um, and that that should somehow matter when you go back to your job and make policy. Um, so all I have to do is tell you that Jesus was a refugee and the Holy Spirit is at work in you and you make policy, so go in peace to love and to serve and figure it out. Um, I'm done by noon on Sunday. Um, so yeah, 
political, we can't get away from partisanship, we avoid prophetic is the calling and we will find ourselves in that voice from time to time and policy is above our pay grade. I think I will, uh, I can go next. Um, I think I'll play the Mennonite card on this one. Um, Mennonites, especially in the United States, and when we lived in Canada, it was a little bit different up here, but there is a very um, kind of a detached relationship, I think, between the Mennonite church and the Mennonite community and the, the nation in which we find ourselves living. Um, I think there's always been this sense of a, of a that we, our allegiance is to God, our allegiance is to the church, to the, this community that we have formed together. We don't say the Pledge of Allegiance. We don't stand for the flag, all of those things, which I think has allowed us to kind of have a healthy skepticism toward the powers that be, whoever they are at that time. Um, when we were up in Canada, we did have a little, we recognized a little bit of a, of a different relationship, I feel like, because in the Canadian context, um, the Mennonite community was so grateful to have been welcomed into this country when they were refugees and needed a place uh, in the early 20th century, fleeing um, Russia, that there was such a gratefulness that there was less of a push against, um, against the powers here. And that was something that I kind of wrestled with. I was like, oh, how do I be a Mennonite in Canada when they're just so grateful? <laughs> um, I don't know how to do grateful. I only know how to be like, Ur, like angry. <laughs> so um, I would say that's largely how, how I would, would approach this. Um, just a sense of skepticism and reminding the church that no matter who is elected, no matter who is in power, that that person is not, you cannot expect that person to enact um, policies that represent the realm of God. Um, maybe they will. I'm not going to say God is powerful. God could use government, <laughs> but um, generally, that's they're they're not working according to the same principles that the church is. Well, you guys probably said it all already, so I could leave it be. But uh, I, I'll just say this, just by way of a challenge, and I think Meg is going to be talking more about this tomorrow morning. Um, but you had four Ps. And you thought you couldn't be a preacher. There you go. Um, but one, one thing that I, I have observed and have talked about, and this is a challenge, and I, I don't have the solution for this challenge, uh, though increasingly I hear pastors crying out for some sort of a solution or, or some way forward. But in the United States, anyway, I don't know how it is here, but in the United States, <clears throat> across the last 20 years, uh, what I would call the acoustics, in the church have changed remarkably. And so I was a pastor, an active parish pastor until 2005, but I noticed that, so we had a very contested election in the United States in the year 2000, uh, George W. Bush and, and Al Gore. Then 9-11 happened, and then the Iraq war happened. And there was an increase in partisanship. And I noticed that in public prayers, as well as in my sermons, things that I could have said or prayed or preached in 1997 that people would have perceived as a whisper, by 2004 it sounded like a scream. It didn't raise an eyebrow in 1997. Use the exact same phrase in the prayer in 2004 and you're being political. You're a Democrat. We know you're a Democrat. We know you don't like Bush. That's why you said that. It has gotten far worse since I left. The Obama years were polarizing, and boy, oh boy, it is bad now. And pastors are stuck because what's one of the major themes in all of Scripture? How we treat the stranger within our gates, the immigrant. It's all over the Old Testament. It's all over the New Testament. It's not my fault that I talk about it. It's, it's in the Bible. Blame the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's in there. Um, but they can't even broach it in a lot of places without being accused of being anti-Trump or pro-Trump or whatever, and they're, you know. So then what do you do? You just they stay on the level of platitudes, you just choose safe, nice psalms. Uh, what do you do? Uh, because, you know, Jesus and Luke comes across a certain way on economics, for instance, and so forth and so on. So uh, the acoustics have become so attenuated and so sharp now that a lot of pastors feel kind of stuck in neutral because open your mouth, and you'll get hit from one side or the other, maybe both. Uh, and that's just a real problem we've got right now. Everybody hears everything through a split screen. 
of talking heads. Well, I think the listeners are also wounded. I think no. that people are so wounded that they are very easily um, injured, <laughs> that they're kind of inflamed, and so everything hurts. Um, we had a continuing ed event at my seminary, uh, Dayton, Ohio. We had a mass shooting that happened in August. And just a couple weeks after that, I had been, this had been planned for over a year. I was doing a, a continuing ed event looking at trauma and preaching. And it was well attended because the pastors were unsure of how to engage with the trauma that the community had experienced. And so many of them, so this shooting happened on a Saturday night, and these pastors had to get up on Sunday morning and felt compelled to say something. And so many in their congregations did not want to hear it. They accused these pastors of being political when they were just simply trying to, from the pastor's standpoint, staunch the bleeding that was happening in, in the community. And so I think they felt like they, they couldn't even offer a word of healing or hope without being accused. And so it's just, it's very tough out there. Um, yeah, I pray for the pastors all the time. Yeah. I, I, I long for the kingdom of Jesus Christ, if only for the fact that we won't have to revise our sermons and our worship plans late on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning because something has happened. Um, and that feels like a regular, a far too regular occurrence. And, and you do, you have to figure out... It, Right. And, you know, so we're all in the U.S. context, so gun violence is, yeah. that's, a, that's a big thing we got going for us. Yeah. Um, and so it just happens so regularly, and it's, okay, so is this a time when I scrap the sermon and start over? Do I have an in on the sermon I've already got that I can kind of weave a tangent in? Does this belong in the morning prayer? Does the, do I just say something in the announcements? Like, how much work do I need to do, and, and how do we even make the call on that? I mean, that's pretty grim. It is. I, sadly, I, a lot of working pastors have a kind of a standard funeral sermon that they have always ready to go if they need to. I have a friend who has a mass shooting sermon <laughs> that he just adapts and is always ready to go. And I'm like, oh, like, this, this is our world. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm going to change the tone a little bit. Yes, please. <laughs> so tell us about a hobby or an activity that you love to do that's totally unconnected with your paycheck. Well, I collect guns. No, I do not. Um, well, there's several things. I mean, I, one, one thing, um, I mean, I, I, I love bird watching. Right? Just that. Um, I also, um, just some years ago, I, I just sort of got into, uh, it, it started a little bit after college during seminary, but then took off more. Um, I just love dabbling in kind of gourmet cooking. I mm -hmm. took uh, several gourmet cooking classes with somebody who had studied with Julia Child and had won a James Beard Award and so forth. So I, I love cooking yeah. and eating. <laughs> I'll, I'll echo that. Uh, I got married about three and a half years ago and I sort of knew how to cook and my husband didn't know how to cook at all. Um, well, I mean, he could make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and heat up mixed vegetables in a microwave. Um, so we wanted to learn how to cook together, but my teaching him was not, like that was not gonna be a good <laughs> dynamic for our early marriage. So we started with Blue Apron, um, and that has been, a, do they have that in Canada, Blue Apron? It's a meal delivery service, and they bring you all the ingredients and you figure out how to cook. So we have learned how to cook together, um, and that's become a really enjoyable part of our life. Go to both of your houses and eat. Um, my husband's a working pastor. We have two little kids, a six-year-old and a three-year-old. So I'm like hobbies. Like so, I like my my hobby recently, which I don't know that it is terribly life-giving, but I've been a minion uh, for the PTA. For my my daughter is in first grade, so I have uh, helped with setup and takedown for some fundraising events at her school, which I, it's a break from from the church and from writing and teaching. So yeah. <laughs> okay, so I need to get uh, some hobbies. <laughs> tell us, tell us one thing on your bucket list that you hope will happen before you do kick that b proverbial bucket. Goodness, 
<laughs> well, I, I, oh, I, I will assume that the doctor that's been attributed to my name at this conference is uh, eschatological hope. So maybe that's the, uh, um, I'd like to pursue further education at some point. Um, and I'd also like to travel, um, particularly to Africa. Um, I grew up overseas, but that's a continent I haven't lived on, so I would like to. I would like to work with uh, doctoral students. I think even though I love, um, I love working with pastors and love working with the master's students, I would love to work with people who are kind of shaping the future of teaching, preaching. I think that would be um, invigorating. I would love to ride in a hot air balloon. I saw one the other day. I've never ridden in one. I think that would be a great way to travel if you were not in a hurry. And I would like to go to Israel. I would uh, love to do that. I have not had a chance to do that. I rarely think along those lines, although I guess just in terms of travel and so forth, I mean, I, I would love to see, uh, I would love to go to New Zealand. Uh, every time uh, somebody that I know goes there, it just, it looks gorgeous. So Australia, New Zealand, in terms of uh, travel places, I've been, I've been privileged, to, uh, I've been to Africa, uh, I got to go to Japan some years ago, which I never, I've got, had a lot of things I never thought was ever gonna happen to me, uh, but I've never been down under uh, or New Zealand. So in terms of travel, that'd be something I would love to see someday. All right, if you were to write a novel, what genre would it be, or what would it be about? So, when the Protestant Reformation, clearly I've thought about this. Um, I know. Uh, when the Protestant Reformation happened, um, as a whole, the monks were pretty happy about the, uh, the whole getting married thing. Um, the nuns, not so much. Um, and so there's some really great stories about uh, like them chaining themselves to their convents um, in protest. Uh, I, I think it would be fascinating to imagine what that moment in history was like for those women who had carved a niche for themselves in a world that didn't have a niche for women who wanted to dedicate themselves uh, to academic study and to the church um, and to relationship with one another um, in community. Um, and then they were liberated against their will. Um, and I, 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 would, I would love to spend some time imagining into what that moment was like for them. I'd read it. Um. <laughs> I, I, I'm supremely confident I do not have the requisite gifts or skills to do this, but if I were going to write, I would love to be able to write um, a novel in the, in the genre of middle grade fiction. So on our campus at Calvin, we have Gary Schmidt. Uh, some of you may know Gary. Uh, he wrote Lizzie Bright, The Buckminster Boy, and The Wednesday Wars, and uh, a number of wonderful children's literature. And, and because of Gary's influence, and Neil Planning and I have done this seminar, Imaginative Reading for Creative Preaching, for many years, where we expose preachers to multiple genre to show how each genre of literature uh, feeds the preaching life. And we've always had Gary come in and do a day on uh, adolescent fiction, middle grade fiction, children's literature. Um, and so he's really turned me on to that. So I regularly read Kate DiCamillo now uh, and, and a number of middle grade fiction. And so if I were gonna write a novel, I would love to write a novel for 12 year olds uh, because when you do that really well, 52 year olds like to read them too, like me, although I'm 55 now, but, uh, or Kat, you know, Catherine Patterson, but, but there's a, that noble simplicity of a, of an adult, of a middle grade novel where the language is simple and yet deep and it ties into the deep, deep lives of children whose lives are very deep. They have rich interior lives. Uh, so if I were going to write something, I would love to be able to do it in that genre. Yeah, both of you had such great answers for that. Um, yeah, I think I also am drawn to historical fiction. Um, I have a friend who has done genealogical work for his own family, and there are figures who he has been captured by, and so he has written um, novels kind of around those figures, like fleshing them out, using what he can find about them, but then filling in the details with his imagination. I think something like that could be really cool um, to find those kind of forgotten figures uh, that would have been part of your own, your own DNA. So maybe that. 
Okay, it's time to quit, but I've got one more question that I, I hope you will answer briefly. And that is, we've talked a lot about um, the, the emotions that our parishioners and we ourselves are wrestling with uh, in the turmoil of the culture and politics, but even just the pain of everyday life and all like that. How do you communicate hope? That was a <laughs> <laughs> an ellipsis there again. Uh, yes. Well, I'll go first. I think it was something Johnny was talking about earlier. Um, you know, bringing the, the sermon in for the landing. So in, in Paul Scott Wilson's four pages schema, it's page four grace in the world. It's the, it is the hardest part. Most sermons I hear from students as well as often in the pre stop just short of page four because it's the hard work. It's also where you have to do, so Johnny and I have both written a, a book in the Abington Artistry of Preaching series and my book was about principally about show, don't tell. Telling is easy in preaching, showing is hard. The showing is where you got to get specific and, and that's the hard work. And so, but when you can so what I tried to do tonight by the story at the end about the prisoners and the vegetables, I could tell you all night, it's important to show the kingdom in your life. You, I read a lot of student sermons. They often go like this. It's important to let the kingdom show in your life. Let it show the kingdom in your life. Show it. Can I get an amen? Let's pray, right? Um, <clears throat> I could tell you that, tell you that 25 times at the end of the sermon, and it wouldn't be near as indelible as one story. Oh, that's the show as opposed to the tell. That's where you give people hope. Show them something that's happening right now that you might have a chance to see on Wednesday afternoon or Friday morning this very week. God's on the move. And here's what it looks like. And that's the hard part of preaching. I would say um, cross and resurrection. I think that's, um, I think almost every sermon should pass by the way of the cross and resurrection. And I think that all of our stuff, our troubles, our brokenness dies on the cross and only God can bring life out of death. And I think that is deeply hopeful and you can't find it anywhere else. And so that would be my answer. Yeah, uh, most of us don't work alone. Um, I have a great colleague who handles the ministry of, of worship and music. Um, and the collaboration there is really important. Um, I'm, the, the song that we ended on in worship, um, that did more than any of my sermons could do. And so I think collaborating well in worship um, and recognizing that those, particularly those familiar hymns, um, in places where people are discouraged. Uh, if you can send them out the door with a refrain in their head um, that will carry them through, and that could be a verbal refrain from the sermon, but it also um, leverage the whole service. Um, we're here for a conference on preaching, and that's great, and we, we should all get better at that, but that's like one-third of the hour that people have allotted. Um, and so there's an awful lot of hope that you can do by collaborating well um, on the whole worship service and not just the sermon. I hope you have enjoyed getting to know them a little bit better. Joni, Scott, and Meg, thank you all very much. Thank you. Yeah.